welcome. How are you today? Can we welcome our South Shore campus. God bless you. Welcome, family, down at South Shore. Father, thank you for an awesome day today. We pray that uh, we would be able to get completely out of the way so that your perfect and sovereign way could have uh, full residence in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Delighted that you are with us today. want to encourage you. Here at the Tampa campus on Thursdays, there's a, there's a course. It's called The Days of Noah. And uh, as, as it was uh, in the days of Noah, so it will be when Jesus returns. We're going to be doing all the same things that we know to do. And the Lord's coming. How many of you know the Lord's coming back? Yeah. Come on, the Lord is coming back. And so the class just started a couple of weeks ago. Let me encourage you to join us in that class if you have the opportunity to do so Thursday nights at Tampa campus. We're starting a brand new series today. It's called Legacy. The Bible actually speaks about heritage, and we've kind of adapted that uh, to talk about legacy, uh, let me jump in. Everyone receives a legacy. You all receive a legacy. Somebody ahead of you or your family or a coach or somebody's life or maybe the culmination of a lot of lives then is passed down to you in legacy. And we will all say, I will. I will. We'll all leave a legacy. All of us are going to leave a legacy. The question is, what kind of legacy are you going to de determine to leave? And so what is the sum of your life? Not, not maybe, maybe what you did academically and maybe what you did financially and maybe what you did. But here's the deeper things. What, what about your love for the Lord? What about your love and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ? And what about your family and how did you love and what were your relationships like? And, and uh, how did you open your arms to those who were hurting and broken? And what will that look like to the next generation behind you? What will your legacy be? Because we're all going to leave one and we get to choose what that looks like. That's good news today. Uh, so let's, let's uh, say together uh, that you, you went to be with the Lord today. How many of you know? How, okay, listen, first of all, nobody's going to be with the Lord today in the name of Jesus. Well, we've, all, we've all got a long ways to go. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Uh, but let's just, for example, say that maybe uh, today was the day you were before the Lord and we were going to eulogize you. We we're going to do your service, your memorial. And uh, you had a friend, and you had a neighbor, you had a coworker, you had somebody from your family, and now the lights are on, and it's about you. Now listen, you can't coach these people on what to say, because you're gone. What would they say about you? What would they say about the sum total of your life? Not just an adjective here and there, or something to describe you. What would they say about the sum of your life? And the summary is, here's the legacy that he or she is leaving we know it not in part, but in whole, this is what it looks like. And I want to say this to you. If it's not what you would prefer it to be today, in the name of Jesus and because he shed his blood on the cross, you get to change that. You get to change that today. Here's the big idea. Who you choose to serve will determine the kind of legacy you leave. Who you choose to serve will be the foundation upon which the rain and the storms will come, all of those things in life. Jesus says, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And, and so listen, the foundation, who you serve, and, and namely, we're going to talk about Joshua for a second, and Joshua names all these different groups of people, and then and that summary for us is self. And what it comes down to today is, is that we either serve ourselves or we serve the Savior, we serve ourselves or we serve God. Here's the foundation. Uh, Moses was commissioned to lead the people in. They did not go in because of fear and unbelief. Joshua was raised up. A new generation was raised up behind him. They had a different spirit about them. Somebody say a different spirit. Come on, say, I have the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Mm, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I have the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. And so they believed God. They trusted God. They went in. They conquered Jericho. They conquered almost all of the land that was there. Almost all of the land. They conquered it. But there was probably 5% of the land that was left, and, and Joshua was addressing the people at the end of his life, and he's saying that they're starting to co-mingle. They're starting to mingle their faith and their ideologies. They're starting to mingle their marriages. They're starting to, uh, their, their purity is getting milky. How many of you know that the church in America is a little milky today? It's a little milky it's a little murky because we name God over here and then we serve self over here and we name the devotion of God here and then we're devoted to other things over here and we kind of mix and match our gods and Joshua is very, very clear and plain, some famous words that he has, Joshua 24, 14 and 15, here's a new international version. He says, now fear the Lord, everybody say fear. fear. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness, everybody say serve. serve. 
fear and serve, fear and serve, fear and serve. They go together. And maybe you haven't under, understood the principle, the concept. When we're talking about fear in the Lord. I pray today when you leave that you'll have a healthy fear of the Lord. And I pray that you will serve him with every bit of your life. Serve him with every bit of your life. Because that's the foundation for the next generation. That's the sum total of your life. That's what you will leave in your legacy. He says, throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve, not just serve, not just serve, not just serve, seek and serve, seek and serve, devote and serve, love and serve, honor and serve, respect and serve, awe and reverence and serve your God. But the serving the Lord seems undesirable to you. And it's kind of a Hebrew form of mocking. He's addressing a million and a half to two and a half million people. If it's unpleasant or inconvenient or burdensome, how many of you know that serving God is a burden and it's inconvenient a lot of the time? But how many of you understand that that inconvenience and that burden produces the greatest and richest blessing and heritage that you could ever have in all of your life? In all of your life. Come on, let's do it with me. Just put your hands up real quick. Put them up real quick. Put them up. Say, Lord. You inconvenience me anytime you want. All right, now, you're on the hook for it. And he says, if it's undesirable to you, and he's kind of mocking him, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose today. Choose today who you're going to serve, whether the gods your forefathers be on the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord in this house. <laughs> We're going to serve the Lord in my house. And, and uh, let's make that declaration together. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mm. Fear in your heavenly Father. Let's talk about that for just a minute. For the unbeliever, fear is unto death. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it is when a college student, I was probably 22 in college. It was my junior year. And uh, I, was, I had... College football player, done all kinds of crazy things. I had the college football story, and uh, I was at the lowest point of my life, and at the ripe old age of 22, I was ready to take my life. I had everything, full scholarship, beautiful girlfriend. I had, I had all this stuff. I had, you know, football players starting on the football team. I had the whole deal, but I was miserable. I want to tell you, nothing in life is like having Jesus. Nothing in life is like having Jesus. There's nothing at all like having the Lord Jesus, who's the Christ. Nothing in life is like having the Lord Jesus. I was absolutely miserable, and so on the one hand, I was calling out to him, and on the other hand, I was kind of upset, and I was kind of almost taunting him. You know, I need to see you, you know, tonight. I don't need to see you tomorrow. I need to see you today, God, today. And it's like God showed up. It's like he pressed his face through all of eternity. It's like there was a curtain there, and he just went. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. He just pierced down, and he said, you want to talk to me, boy? Amen. And I, I was afraid unto death. I thought I was going to die, so much so that I lost my bodily functions. Not preaching about that anymore. I, I've never been more afraid. You know why? I didn't know him. And I knew that I, and, and right behind that I started confessing the stuff, the sin that was in my life. It was an automatic response creator to creature, oh my goodness, I'm going to perish now. And there is a fear that's for unbelievers, and that fear is unto death. And that fear, that fear will make you perish. In the presence of a living God, you will cease to be uh, alive. You will cease to exist. And, you know, people say that are, that are non-believers, I'm not afraid to die. You should tell them you should be. You should be because it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Thank God that he has the cross behind all of that stuff, and we get to choose him as Savior, right? We get to choose him as Savior and Lord. And, and so uh, I did, and my life changed. And I mean it changed dramatically. And I mean everything about my life changed dramatically from that point on uh, until this day. But there's a different kind of fear that I want to talk to you about. See, that's an unbeliever's fear. I want to talk to you about the fear of the Lord, and I want to talk to you about what the fear of the Lord for a believer looks like. See, the Bible says that it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. It's the beginning of all of our basis. It's the foundation that we have in the Lord. And this fear for us is different than the kind of terror that I was just talking about. And thank God that it is, Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Therefore, since we're receiving this kingdom that cannot be shaken, no matter what happens, listen, I want to ask you a question. Are you going to be shaken? 
The answer, resounding answer is no. Are you going to be answering, are you going to be shaken when Islam comes through your door? Come on, say no. no. We've got to start telling ourselves this because it's coming. You, you, you need to talk, you need to, you need to preserve your soul before you have to answer in your soul. Are you going to be shaken uh, at a college when somebody asks you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? No. No. I'm, I'm, I don't know. At the Tampa campus, we're not sure. We're, we're still, we're, maybe. I mean, I may, I, I want to I tell you something. If you deny him before men, he says he'll deny you before uh, the Father in heaven. There's no option for a Christian. There's, there's, there's no, uh, see, see uh, well, man, I could preach a whole sermon on that. Let me just stay right here in the name of Jesus. Somebody pray for me. Woo! We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, so we're going to be thankful. We're going to be thankful no matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens in our culture, in our city. We're going to be thankful. We're going to worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This, these terms, reverence and awe, is what it means to fear God. If I, uh, how many of you know about the Hope Diamond? The Hope Diamond is a 45-carat blue diamond. It's got 16 white white diamonds around it. You know, check this picture out. It's, it's like the, palm, the size of the palm of my hand. It's a giant diamond, $350 million worth of diamonds. And so if I uh, pubbed it up and I had everybody come to the crossing and, and we said, listen, uh, I've got it in a box here and I want you all to come to get as close as you can and, and are you ready? This is the Hope Diamond. And I opened the case like this, everyone would go, oh, that's all. Reverence. It's respect. It is, it is ascribing a kind of a worship to something that has great worth. That's our God. That's our God. That's what it means to fear God. It means to, to, to bow down in his presence and to kneel down and to maybe put your belly to the ground or maybe put your face to the ground when you pray and to say to him, you are the great creator. I am only the creature. How could you love someone like me? And then you could say right behind it, I know that you love me because of the blood of Jesus. I know you love me because of the blood of Jesus. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful, God. I'm so grateful to be in your presence to honor and worship you. The same fire that burns up the unbeliever purifies the believer. So we run to the fire. And don't you know that that creates that, that thing, that fire, it creates a degree of pain and fear in us. And, and uh, you know, the smelter, when they, they go through the purifying process, they turn the heat up. And the impurities come out. And they turn the heat up again. And the impurities come out. And they turn the heat up again. And the impurities come out. And you know when the refiner knows that the, the gold is pure, when he can see his reflection in it. And that's what God is doing in your life and in my life. There's a, a degree of fear, but the fear is an appropriate righteous fear. There's a, there's a fear of defilement when a believer's life gets dirty and your hands and your feet get dirty. And you've been walking through life and, and uh, you get smudged and gruddy and crimey, not crimey, grimy. You're crying and grimy at the same time, crimey. <clears throat> crimey a river. Anyway, <laughs> defilement means that there's impurity in you, and as a believer, you can be impure, and I want you to know the scripture in, in Isaiah 6, the Bible says that a seraph, an angel, flies and takes a, a, a coal from the altar and he brings it to Isaiah's mouth. He says, woe is me for I'm undone. He's fearful. There's a fear. But it's a righteous fear. He's having a holy picture of God. And he presses that coal to his mouth. And I want you to know that it's the blood that cleanses any impurity that's in your life. And so if you're a believer and you're struggling with impurity right now, I don't know if it's moral impurity, your thoughts, or if there's some physical impurity that you're going through, it's the reapplication of the blood that cleanses you. Just like the original blood that cleansed you. It's the reapplication of the blood. Come on, do this with me. Everybody close your eyes for just this. Uh, look, look up here with me for a second. Listen, and at, at South Shore, wherever, wherever you're at, you're online. Listen, watch this. I want you to close your eyes with me, and then we're going to do this together. Close your eyes for just a moment. Extend your hands and say to the Lord, you don't have to shout this. This is one of those moments now that I want the Lord to be able to touch you. Say, Lord Jesus. Wash me afresh in your blood. Take these stains. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank him today? Can we thank our God today?
Listen. It's the blood. See, the altar was where the sacrifice was sacrificed, and the blood then was poured onto the coals, and it was the coals soaked in blood that was pressed to his mouth that cleanses impurity. And that's the thing that caused Isaiah to be able to say to God, God says, who's going to go for me? And when we're cleansed, you and me can say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. See, there's, there's, there's fear. There's the, the fear of God brings us knowledge, and the fear of God is healthy, and we run to the fire. It causes some pain, but we run to the fire. And the fear of God in, in refinement is a good thing. And the fear of God in defilement causes us to go to God and to reapply the blood of Jesus so that we're cleansed and healed afresh again. Sin does not come off in the shower, church. Sin does not come off. Oh, I'm feeling dirty. I, I mean, you can I take a long, I take long showers, but it's not because the you know the it's look guys. Sin doesn't come off in the shower. It's the reappropriation of the blood. And then this last one is a, a believer's fear in 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 discipline. And, and in the discipline, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that our fathers discipline us as they saw fit, but God disciplines us. He disciplines us righteously to cause us enough pain so that we skip great pain. That's what a righteous father does. Now, I am not talking about, do not associate, if you had a father that misappropriated discipline in your life, and, and uh, really, it's really true that some of you encountered actually evil fathers. The evil and disproportionate man who is, who is destructive, doesn't know God, they actually acted in an evil way. I am not talking about that kind of father in Jesus' name. I am not talking about that kind of discipline in Jesus' name that causes you to have terror. We're not to ha have terror of the Lord and not to be afraid of the Lord, to be filled with terror, the adjective. We are to uh, reverence and honor and respect and awe. How many of you know that if you, if you didn't or you don't, have some degree of healthy fear of your father, then you, you kind of missed out on some fathering. Can I get an amen? amen? Because when dad's voice kind of, it either lowers or hires, I'm not sure which your dad's does, and then the eyes get fixed, you're like, uh-oh, dad's coming for me. Now listen, what dad did when he's coming for you is, is hopefully the fear of dad coming to you and his correction and even the pain of the discipline hopefully cause you not to do some things that you shouldn't have done, right? Come on, church, right? And that's the same thing with your heavenly father. I'm, some of you were in church disciplines. You actually went to churches where the fear of God was taught so, so uh, heartily and, and maybe inappropriately that you were so afraid that you're gonna lose your salvation every time the church doors opened, you were getting saved again. I mean, they would sing the song, you know, I got to get saved again. And you're just getting saved over and over every weekend. You only get saved once, church. In the name of Jesus, you only get saved once. He's your heavenly father. He loves you. 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 And he will pull you up into his arms and you get to cuddle with God. But please don't forget he's the creator of the universe. He's not a doting grandfather that's going to give you a lollipop when you sin. God is so serious about sin that he caused the son to die to relieve it, to relieve it. Come on, I want you to say with me, I don't have to live, come on, in this brokenness. See, now listen, Jesus died for that. He, your foundation is in who you serve. There's lots of options in our world, and the option is there's no fear. The other option that the world puts out for us is don't be afraid of anything, don't fear and you worship or honor, you awe and reverence the God of self. Let me, let me describe this person to you, 2 Peter 2, 10 and 11. Here's what it says. And especially those who walk according to the flesh. And so you, you walk according to the spirit or you walk according to the flesh, that old fleshly person, in the lust of uncleanness. That means that their base appetites are all they live for, what they taste and touch and smell and see and sight. And they want to make a lot and they want to can a lot and they want to be a lot. They want to look a lot. You want to have a lot. It's all the stuff. And that's what they live for. They despise or disesteem, honor and reverences, <gasps> esteem. They disesteem, they despise authority. 
They despise authority because not being fathered, we have so many fatherless generations that anytime anybody, now you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever you are, and any fatherly figure that comes to you either at work or church or whatever it is, there is, you, you, you're, you feel dislocated or dislodged or judged, and so there's a despising of all authority. It can end in all these crazy things. Any representative, uh, even angels and the Lord himself, they're presumptuous and self-willed, they're arrogant, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. And again, representatives, uh, angels, and God. And then it goes on, whereas angels who are greater than we are right now in power and in might do not bring reviling accusation against them before the Lord because these angels understand authority, respect and honor God, and even in their distreatment, they do not utter slanderous things. Uh, now listen to me, listen to me. What you say, what you say, what, we, what you say, what comes out of your mouth determines oftentimes who you serve. What you say determines who you serve, and, and your trust is all in your pronouncements. I, there was a lady at one time, I was teaching a biblical principle of tithing, and I know that tithe is, is uh, I'll, I'll teach it to you sometime. If you're brand new at the crossing, you take a tenth portion of your income, and that's the very first portion you give to God. That's the first portion, and you give it in trust. You give it in trust that the Lord's going to bless the 90 that you have. And uh, I know it's a tough concept if you're brand new. I want to tell you this. Um, it is the thing that is the key to the blessing of your life financially and otherwise in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen, church? Okay, so I'm teaching the concept, and I'd been in group with them for a long time, and I know them, and they were always talking, talking about how the church wants their money. Have you ever heard that one before? The church just wants my money. The church just wants my money. The church just wants my money. And this is repeated over and over. And, and it would come out in different places. And, and, uh, and so, and listen, the church does need your finances to run. But God doesn't need your money. God needs your heart. And your heart is tied to your resources. And that's why money is spoken about more than any other thing in the Bible. That's why I spoken. And God wants the house to be strong at the same time. And so they would talk about the pastors. And, and, and so what they were talking about was God. They're really talking about the Lord. And so she said to me, and this is the only time this ever happened, never happened like this before. She said, God just doesn't drop money out of the sky. He didn't just drop money out of the sky. He just, you know, God's not like that. And I said, well, I know God provides for you anyway. Well, they go, she goes, I need $1,000 for my rent next week. And I went, something happened inside of me. I said, God's going to take care of that. And then I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe God slash Greg is going to take care of that. <clears throat> uh, so that's that issue of faith, right? And so it was $1,000, and I, so I'm on the hook now for $1,000, and, and what came out of my mouth next was, you come next Wednesday, and I'm going to have $1,000. God's going to give you the $1,000. And I got done, and I'm like, oh, boy. I'm, I mean, wow, you know, God, I just cashed a check. I hope you wrote it, you know, because <laughs> it just came out. It just came out right away. And so she came on a Wednesday, and I, I, I promise you, this is one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. She was supposed to come on Wednesday. Somebody came to the church on a Tuesday. A guy came in and he said, hey, I need to talk to a pastor. I was available. He said, a year ago, you gave me $100. I got a settlement. He said, I don't know why I'm supposed to give you $1,000 today. And that was on a Tuesday. Okay. And so I'm jumping up and down. I'm like, oh, in reverence. I'm on my knees and my face crying. God is good. I love you. You know, it's crazy. So I was so excited for her to come. And she sat down at the table and, and I really laid it out. And I told her the whole, whole discussion that I had with the guy. And I said, and the Lord has provided for you this $1,000 for your rent in time. It is, a, it is a real life miracle. And I slid the $1,000 over to her and her face never changed. The expression on her face never changed. And she said, what about my electric bill? Okay, now listen to me. Those who serve self cannot see the Savior. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what God does for you, you can't see him. It doesn't matter how much he loves you, you can't receive his love. He doesn't matter how much he, it doesn't, he could die on the cross every day ten times and we go, nah, I don't know if that's for me. Because when the focus is yourself, what you say is the, the determination. She left, she took the thousand dollars and she left the church, literally talking about how God doesn't provide for them. Self, you see, when Joshua says, you serve the gods before the river or in Egypt or you serve the Amorite gods, the summary of all of that is self, church. It's self. It's just self because I could prop up gods that are wooden and all I want them to do is to serve me. 
And the, and the scripture is saying, you choose today. Here's what Joshua says. You choose today who you're going to serve because that will determine your legacy. That will determine your legacy. So here's the question as we, as we wrap up. Who are you going to serve? Who, who? You think about this for a minute today. I want you to really examine your life. Who are you going to serve? Because when we talk about serving, we, we've, we've, got to, we've actually got to go this far. And I'm going to go as far as I can with the teaching. And then, and then I'm, I'm going to bring us up in the next few weeks and talk to us and so on. And we've got to go. We've got to surrender our souls all the way to a freeing slavery. Let me, let me say it again. We've got to surrender our souls, mind, will, and emotion. To, we've got to surrender all of that to a soul-freeing kind of slavery. Jesus was a slave, was he not? He emptied himself of the form of God, came in the likeness of man, died on the cross. Even unto the end of his life, he was under the form of bondage of slavery to you and me, and he only did what the Father said. He said, I would like to do this, but the Father said to do that, slave attribute. I understand we don't like the term slavery, but please go with me biblically for just a moment. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Okay, watch this. Jesus says in the garden, he's about to die, and he says, Lord, uh, Father, take this cup from me, but not what? Not my will, but what? Your will be done. Now, how painful was that? How painful, how difficult, how hard was that? How, how, how hard and difficult was that? And the Lord said, I bruised, and, I bruised and, and caused to be broken my son that you could live, that you could live. Jesus was in servitude like a slave. And the Bible says if you want to be first, you've got to be a slave to all. And most of all, the foundation of your life has got to be serving the Lord. I am absolutely, in, I am absolutely indebted to you. In the Old Testament, a slave would serve a six-year uh, period. And at the end of the sixth year, they'd come to the sabbatical year, the year of Jubilee in the seventh year, and they would be dismissed. They were free. They were free to go. And many times, the slave would leave. They would go. But sometimes what would happen at the end of that six years is that the slave would come back to the master and say, where else can I go? And I want to ask you that question, where else can you go? Who else are you going to serve? What other life do you have other than serving God and devoting your life to the Lord in, in righteousness and fear and in hope of the Lord and his devotion and development for you? What is the next generation going to look like behind you if you serve yourself instead of serving the Lord? And when that indentured servant would come back and they would say, uh, I want to stay here. I, be, I, be your, I want you to be my master for the rest of my life. They would take an awl, it's an old school instrument, and they would place the, the servant's ear to the door and they would put a hole in their ear and pierce that ear as a sign of physical possession for the rest of that uh, servant's life unto the master. And I want to say to you today, it's time for us in America to put our ear to the door and let the all of the Lord be pressed in. See, we got to die to self. We got to die to self, don't we, church? We got to die to self, don't we? We got that. The old you, the old you who, who has a right in their marriage to, you might be, <laughs> here's the deal. <laughs> you might be right, but in your rightness, you harm and break your, the person that you've committed to love and be devoted to. And, you know, you might be right when somebody wrongs you and you go, you know, an eye for an eye. You might be right, but you lose your relationship and you shame and defame yourself. And, you know, and I, I've heard some people lately in the last five, six weeks are saying, you know what I'm doing? I'm just getting off Facebook. No, no, I'm not suggesting that you get off Facebook. I'm just, it's just what happens is people go, that's a platform for somebody who's an individual to make as much noise and to bring as much shame and harm to another person as they possibly can. Now, and Facebook is cool. I mean, friends and family connection, all that stuff. And, but, but you might be right. See, when you're a slave, you give up your rights, don't you? You don't have the right to hold unforgiveness because you've been forgiven. You don't have the right to slander because the devil stands to slander you and Jesus says, be quiet, Satan. That's my son or daughter. In uh, Greek and Roman culture, when a person committed a sin that was grave enough, they would take a dead person, they would exhume a dead person and they would tie back to back the dead person to the living person. <laughs> what a penalty. 
and you would carry with you the dead person until you became so faint you would not be fed and not have enough water and so on that you died. And I'm going to tell you this. Jesus came for you to cut away the dead person. He came so that you don't. See, look, you can't worship with a dead person on your back, church. You can't serve with a dead person on your back, can you? You can't give with a dead person on your back. You can't, your hands can't move for Jesus with a dead person on your back. This is the question is today, who are you going to serve? Because who you serve will determine your legacy. Who you choose to serve is going to determine your legacy, the sum of your life. It's, going to, it's, going to, it's right, it's real, it's your foundation. And, I, and so here's what we stand together to say today. I, I don't know who you're going to serve. Come on, but say it with me. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Would you pray with me? Just bow your heads. Father, thank you that there's awestruck wonder in your name, that you're perfect, you're powerful, you're wonderful, you're kind, you're just, you're loving, that we're to have an appropriate reverence and awe and, and fear of you. When we mention your name, When we mention your name, I pray that we'd have a physical response in devotion and reverence for you. How many of you today, just by a show of hands, heads bowed and eyes closed, you'd say, man, I want to serve God with my whole life. I want nothing, nothing to hold me back. I want to give all of my servitude to the Lord. Would you raise your hands by a show of hands all around the house and at South Shore? Hold them up. Hold them up for just a second. Father, help us to count the cost of what that means. Help us to be real with you. Help us to step into our fear, step into pain, to be disciplined by you righteously and to receive the fullness of the love that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, right here in at South Shore Campus, if you're at home, we're gonna make a declaration of faith in Jesus Christ. It's a very simple one. We're gonna give up our old lives. We're gonna give up the sin that's attached to that. And then we're going to receive salvation. Every voice, if you will, you don't have to shout, but every single voice, every voice. Here in that South Shore, Lord Jesus. Come on, let's start again. Lord Jesus, on this day, out of my sovereign will, the one you gave me, I choose to relinquish my life, to get rid of the old person, to get rid of sin in exchange. I receive receive from your promised word word. salvation. Salvation. Say, I receive receive. grace, Grace. love, Love. righteousness, Righteousness. and a new peace. peace. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, just for another moment, both campuses, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, very first time you're saying, Jesus, I'm surrendering to you on this day, I'm going to ask you to indicate that to us by raising your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. Raising your hands all over the house, wherever you are, right here in at South Shore. I see you. Gotcha. Amen. I gotcha. Thank you. Raise them nice and tall. Gotcha. Nice and tall. Nice and tall. Amen. Gotcha, sir. Gotcha. 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 It's awesome. Anybody else on this day? Anybody else? I'll wait for just a moment. Amen. Can we thank our God today? Come on, can we celebrate the Lord today? Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Come on, can we really celebrate before the Lord today? Thank God for people who trust in Christ. All right, so let's stand together. Let's stand, and I'm going to ask that the, if there's any movement, that the movement is towards the front here to the altar now, let me, let me do this. If, let me ask our, our prayer partners to come forward, and we're going to sing. We're going to pray for just a moment. Let the song be your cue. If you trusted Christ to come forward and to be prayed with, we're going to connect you to the church. Let me say this. Let me say this. If you've been a believer for 40 years, and on this day you'd say, I want to come forward. I want to leave the dead man right here. I want to leave the dead woman right here. In, in just a minute, I'm going to pray, and I'm going I'm to move out of the way. We're going to sing a chorus for just a second, and then Pastor Richard's going to close us. Very important time in our service.
Very important time in our service. You make a decision who you're going to serve today. You leave that dead person right here. Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you that upon the declaration of our faith to leave that old man or woman right here at this altar, that you would give us a free, new, vigorous life in you to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you begin to make your way. Just make your way. If you want to leave him here, her here, come on.